Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the day four or fifth time we meet since uh, the start of the summer. And so that means we are concluding now, or at the end of today's lecture, we will conclude the uh, first week of five. That's one fifth of the course material. So that's going pretty fast. So, um, we got some beers. All right, people are here, you guys are just quiet. That's fine with me. So today, um, well, class is happening at seven, but uh, over the weekend, I will update you on, hello, yay, we got somebody saying hi. Cool, hello. Um, we, I'll check the poll and see what the results are, and then we, I'll, I'll update the time based on that. So if you haven't voted on the poll yet, Make sure you do. It's on Discord. I think it has. It's on the under announcements. That way, it doesn't get squished down. It was also on like one of the channels, but that of course just got lost in the chat. So it's on the announcement tab. So make sure you you uh, you vote on that and pick the times that are more convenient for you. And then I will go ahead and pick the one that the highest. You know, so far I saw like a two camel thing. Like people wanted like in the afternoon and in the morning. And, but at the time there was only like 12 votes, so it could totally change now the next time I check it So hello um, I did want go ahead and reset the extra credit thing So now you can request for more if you got the points, but okay Let's get going on then So Today uh, we are going to continue right where we left off last time which was we were introducing uh, arithmetic operations like addition subtraction and so on in C++ uh, from there I'm going to show you how to read input which you kind of need for something too actually you need CN if you don't know it already and then from there we're going to uh, start talking about the if statement and logic operators which is one of the ways that you can control an if statement so that's what the plan is for today We'll see how much we get there. I'm pretty sure we'll get at least a lot of the first two. We'll see how far we get with the last two. If not, we'll keep going. Um, I, I did move back assignment three um, and two. I don't know. Just check Canvas. But I did update some of the due dates to make them a little bit later. So you have a little bit more time. However, I think that you should be able to finish either of those assignments really quickly. The hard ones come later. These are like, I mean... Even if you don't, even if you just learn the stuff, I, I, I don't think more than 20 minutes for the assignments. Um, obviously, if you know the stuff, you'll do it in like two seconds, but of course, you guys are learning. So, you know, I'm putting in that sort of, well, let me go reference this and that as one of the assignments. So, okay. Uh, is there anything I want to write? Not really. I think we just want to go right into coding. So, let's just jump right in. Uh, let me move that away. Okay. So now, yeah, cool. This is literally what we were doing last time. Uh, I was showing you how to use the CMAT library. I went ahead and called sign, and we fed in a variable. So we're talking about variables, and we said it works just like a mathematical function, f of x. So in math, when you have f of x is equal to x plus 2, that means that your input is x and your output is f of x. And how to get from input to your output is the plus 2 part. So let me go ahead and write just what I said down so to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, do note that I'm using these kind of comments so that I can write here without affecting my code. So if I have something like this, f of x is equal, and this is math, this is not programming. In math, if I have f of x is equal to, maybe more complicated than that, 4x plus 2. Okay, what that means is that my input is x and my output is f of x. And the process of getting from in to out is going to be to take that value of x, multiply times 4, hello puppy, and uh, add 2 to it. Okay, so if x is equal to let's say 10 
then you're going to take 10, you're going to multiply it times 4, so it's going to become 40, and then you're going to add 2 to it, and you're going to get 42. So when you feed it 10, it's always going to give you back 42. That is the idea of a function in math, and it's very, 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 very similar to a function in programming, at least a value returning function. And so in the case of the sine function, the input is our a here, and that's because we just called it a, but that's kind of our x. And then the, there is some math happening inside of that, and the result is another value. In this case, it's a decimal value, so it's a double or a floating point. Uh, what is actually the, 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 the sine uh, formula do? Uh, well, it's the sine wave. So, you know, this is trigonometry, but if you just go on Google sine wave, um, sine wave math. Oh, here we go, this one. Yeah, this one will do. So, if you see, these right, see this right here, oh no. There we go. Come on. It's because it's between two monitors. It's the only way things. So we can see here that the sine of zero happens to be zero. The sine of oh, there's no, there's no uh, x coordinates there. Hold on. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, sine wave in math. Here we go. This one's better. Yeah. Good enough. I suppose this one's oh this one's not okay this one's in degrees so sure the, the sine wave in C math is in radians but we all probably know the degree version because it's the one that they usually cover and the one that we remember from uh, our trigonometry class and so the sine of x the sine of zero is zero the sine of pi is also zero and then in between that there's a range that goes from zero to one which happens at half pi and then it comes back to zero, and then at three, three halves pi, it's negative one. Uh, if you're looking at it in radians, I think this, this is the one above it. So in that case, they're saying when you get to almost five, it's uh, it's gonna be um, negative one and so on. But yeah, that's pretty much the degree one. So anyways, the point is that it's just a math formula, okay? And so other math formulas are things like power, exponent. So what is that one we can actually create? And later on in the class, when we actually talk about making our own functions, we'll make that as a practice function. Uh, but for now, if you were to do a mathematical version of that, you could write it actually as this. The, uh, the function that is exponent is takes an x and then multiplies it by itself once and then brings it back to you. Now, this is a specific one for doing um, uh, squared. If you wanted to do a cube one, we could do the same thing. We just add another times x, okay? Uh, here's the thing. What if we wanted to have something variable? This is where we kind of, uh, uh, maybe I'd say, you, you call it, we, 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 we guide separately from math. Because I don't know if in math they would do this, but here, Instead of just having a single input value, instead of having an x, we're going to have two. We're going to have, let's call it x and b, okay? Or maybe e, yeah, for exponent. So we have something of this format. f of x comma e equals, and then we can say x to the e. And that's just a symbol in math for exponent, I suppose. And so this is saying, okay, our input is two variables, which then get x to the power of the second variable. And then that f of x e, you get back uh, the power function, basically. Okay? And that's how power works. And I think we, uh, we tried it out up here, as you can see, and we did also square root. Okay? So, anyways, that's how, that's as much as we'll talk about functions for now, until we talk about until we really talk about functions and we talk about making them and whatnot and they're very 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 important part of programming but they're more later on the course because there's other more fundamental things you should know such as an if statement which is what we're trying to get to or even just basic math or variables which we covered last time okay so cool i did see somebody claim the extra credit so good good, good. after the end of the class I, you gotta make sure you tell me who you are don't don't put it here because it's public but on discord send me a message or on Canvas, uh, identifying yourself, 
so that I can give the points to the right person because I don't know I don't know who you are on, on canvas otherwise I don't know who to give the extra credit to uh, just don't post it here because if you post it here it's public and you might want to have your uh, anonymity uh, how do we redeem that um, channel points uh, Nikan can help you out so yeah you guys you guys help each other out yeah okay so um, that's that was that's the show I'll be review hopefully from last time now we were just going to start doing some basic math and I was showing you and we were talking about integer division and all these other things. So it works just like algebra. It is algebra, I'd say. Uh, not, not like super complicated algebra, but still algebra. We have multiple variables, which can be in this case integers or floats or doubles or anything like that. And we have operations between them. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. Um, the one trick to this all is division. When you're dividing two integers, the resulting division is going to be an integer. That is a little bit misleading from something like um, a normal division in like a calculator or something. If I say, what is five divided by two, you're gonna tell me is 2.5. Well, computer is gonna tell you it's not 2.5, it's just two. That's just what it's gonna say. It's gonna drop the decimal. It's not gonna round, because I would round up to three technically. No, it's just gonna drop it. It's just gonna drop the decimal and keep the uh, the whole number part. How do we avoid that? How do we get actually an exact division? Uh, there are two ways that we can do it. One of them is we can make both the numerand and denominator of our sort of fraction looking thing, or in other words, we can make either of these values a, uh, a double and, and then that or a float. And in that case, when you do division between a type that is not an integer and an integer, the other type sort of wins and the accuracy is kept. However, that's just the accuracy at the division. But in this case, we are storing it in C. When you store something with a decimal into it, so like if I create right now a variable called int D equals 3.4 or 3. This is 3.999, like that. I can do that. That's perfectly fine. But it's going to store at 3 into D. And I can show you that really fast here. That way we can make sure that uh, we got everything up and running here. So see out D. Is this the third program? We'll find out. There's nothing that printed out. Oh, because I didn't actually add D to print out. There we go. And by the way, that was a question at the end of the last class. You don't need these spaces. I put them because it makes it easier to read, but you don't technically need them. As you can see, there you go. You get a three, even though you have 3.999. That's why your the data type of your variable is very, very important depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to go for accuracy, you don't want to use an integer if there's decimals involved. Anyways, so, uh, in this case, if we go ahead and change one of these to a double, that will be okay for the division. But then again, just like here, when you store it into C, you're gonna lose that accuracy. And so you need to also make C a double or a float to be able to maintain that decimal. So um, let's go ahead and do that. Make it a float. You shouldn't switch back and forth between double and float, by the way. Stick to one. Bad things happen if you do. So, oh, we never, we never print it out. So here, let's see out. Let's change this to uh, print out. Let's see. There we go. And there you go, 1.6667. That's what we expected. You do see there's a little bit of rounding there that when we talk about IOM and IP and text formatting, you can figure out how many decimals you want to print out um, and so on and how that rounding works and whatnot. So for now, it's just kind of giving you, up, what is this, five digits. So before here, you can see this was also uh, technically six digits, but that's zero. So anyways, don't worry about that for now, okay?
And so we have addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, and division. That division being the, the weird one, per se. Because, actually, let's try one, one more. Here. Let's try multiplication between an integer and a decimal. How about that? That's a good one. You don't have to, by the way, uh, use variables. I could just literally do something here with literals. I could do five times uh, 2.1. Let's do actually three, because that's easier to do in my head. That's 6.3, right? Okay. Let's do that and see uh, how that goes. 6.3. Yeah, that's exactly what I expected. Notice that here we have an integer and a double and it's, it is maintaining the double accuracy because you're putting two together. It's uh, impossible to have two integers multiplied together and give you something with decimals because two whole numbers can't give you decimals when you multiply them together. So there doesn't need to be any situation like with the division where there's lots of precision there. Um, so yeah, that don't, division is the only one that you gotta really think about. Okay, uh, I, last time, very briefly, I, I, I posted this. Let me just quickly go over. This is the range of numbers that an integral or integer can keep, which is from 2.1 positive to negative 2.1. Floating points, this is the range, but it's not inclusive of every single value in between, as I spent a lot of time last time going over. Uh, let's act, talk about these other extra data types, okay? So, car, short, uh, long and boolean okay so let's talk about well, sh well car we know car is for characters right uh, let me let me just put one in here let's put in 65 like that so car uh, uh, make sure you can't use c because you've already used c if you try to do that it'll complain that you're redeclaring it but we can do cc of course naming convention you don't want to you, you don't want to uh, you don't want to name your variables like that but you know for class and trying to get things done quickly it's good enough why did this do this one sec there we go okay it printed out an A is that what 65 is in the ASCII table I don't know I frankly was just guessing turns out that it's uh, that it's uh, it's A even though I didn't store A, I stored it as a, as a number. Because it's a car, it translates it to whatever 65 is in the ASCII table. Okay? So, what happens if I do 65 plus 1? So, what if I do CC equals CC plus 1? What do you think that's going to give me, chat? You guys tell me. And while you guys tell me that... I'm going to go ahead and uh, read around and see what else I want to show you. 66. Well, 61, 65 plus 1 is indeed 66, but what is going to get printed out to the screen? That's the real question. So what am I going to get? Before I got an A... What do you think am I going to get now? B. Um, B, but is it lowercase b or is it uppercase b? And the answer is it's uppercase b. Uh, you can't see it, of course, but now you can. Okay. So basically, when you store something as a car, you can, you can manipulate it with numbers by adding and subtracting anything you could do with an integer. However, at the end of the day, when it's going to actually be converted into a car, into whatever the ASCII table contains for that, that's when you do. This is very, very useful because uh, if you're trying to say shift all letters because you're trying to conceal a message, you can add a number to all letters and you have some sort of shifting. That's how Caesar cipher works, actually, um, by shifting everything times 13, which is called rotation 13 uh, Caesar cipher. So... Uh, there is a big usage of this. Um, you could also switch everything to lowercase this way, although there's a function that will do that for you. But you could do it this way by shifting it the number of uh, letters that is in the ASCII table between A and lowercase a. So anyway, that's a car for you. Um, one more. Oh, wait, two more. We got short. 
s and long l so short is also the same for just just know this about short it works the same way as an integer in theory it's supposed to take less memory it's supposed to only take 16 bit instead of 32 bit i do believe nowadays even if you declare something in short it's going to be kept in as an integer and you win nothing by doing it back in the day you you would you would save space because you would only use half the space and you will use it for numbers that are a smaller range because a short can only go up to like 56,000 positive and 56,000 negative so um yeah i don't know why my dog is is licking me a lot but yeah she's distracting me okay uh, long on the other hand is very very useful a long is basically an integer that i believe uses 64 bit and so it can, it can keep bigger numbers whole numbers a bigger range of them so instead of storing from negative 2.1 billion to positive 2.1 billion it's going to store um let's google actually that number uh long in range it stores from well, a long is just nothing. There's no difference. But if you do something like a long, long, this is a big number. It goes into, well, here, I'll just paste it on, uh, I'll paste it on Twitch chat because I don't feel like figuring out what that number is. But see, it's a big number. See that? Big number. Like in the billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, I think. So. That's useful because you can keep every single number between those two in there. Whole numbers, but everything. Useful, but there's always going to be someone who wants even a bigger number. So there's also the unsigned long long, which keeps from 0 to 18 uh, of the same values, like from 9, you know, whatever it is, quintillion or something. Uh, because in this case, I'm only keeping the positive numbers. And if you want to go longer than that that's when you got to go with your own custom data types or if you want decimals of that size that is fully accurate okay and so uh, if you want to find out more here's the link that I found about the built-in data types and the different sizes uh, let me do an example of the unsigned thing just to so show you what it looks like you would type, and you could also do unsigned integer. So let's do that one actually. Unsigned integer. Uh, let's call that u. And then you just store a number like that. And that's pretty much it. Uh, in this case, when you do something that's unsigned, technically, even though you don't put it whenever you're doing like a normal integer, that's called a signed integer. Unsigned means that you don't keep a range from positive and negative numbers, you only keep positive numbers. Um, we call that last or first bit actually the if whether it's signed or not the signature and if it's a one it's usually a negative number and if it's a zero it's a positive number and so if you don't need to use that bit to signify positive or negative you double the amount of numbers you can keep because it's a power of two instead of two to the 31st power it's two to the 32nd power and that's why instead of having a range of 2.1 billion negative to 2.1 billion positive you have from zero to basically 4.2 billion. So you're just shifting stuff around. And the same works with the other data types that are for numbers. Of course, you don't do that for a car because a car is unsigned in the first place. If you try to store in a car a negative number, uh, bad things will happen because there's no such thing in the ASCII table. You'll actually get an error or at least a warning. Let's go ahead and, and see that in action. Uh, you didn't get a warning. That's weird. Uh, I think there's, because if I do dash wall, there you go. Uh, unuse variable, variables. Mm. Normally you get a warning that says out of range. Um, I'll figure out. There's, by the way, notice what I did here with the dash wall. That adds extra uh, warnings that should give you warnings about things you should, you should that are not necessarily errors, but the compiler is like, hey, you may want to check this out. In this case, these are actually valid. It's saying that I have all these variables that I declared, but I never used them. And it's true, I was declaring S, L, and U, 
And I actually never used those variables. Like I never did math today. I never printed them out. They're just there, not doing anything. Useless, taking up space. Um, basically, that's what that's telling me. And it, it's correct. I, I wasn't using them. So yeah, it's a useful tip to compile that way with the dash wall. There's also, I think, pedantic, or maybe that's a C thing. Um, yeah. And then there's, there's a couple more. So you want to Google compile flags in G++ and you can find out more that way. But anyways, can't remember. I, I do know when you, when I was using, um, yeah, let's try, I, I have an idea to see if we can get, the, get an error out of this. Oh, by the way, do notice that it, when it tried to print out the thing, it did print out some weird question mark here. That's just, it, it look, it, I know it's really tiny, but what that looks like is a little diamond with a question mark inside. That means that it tried to convert it to an ASCII value and it's not a valid value. And so it's, it's like confused what you're trying to print out. So it prints out a question mark. So whenever you see that in your output, it means that you're printing out garbage basically that has no meaning in the ASCII table. So even though we didn't get a warning, we definitely did get an error there. Um, let's try this and see if it does give us, give us a warning here. Key up or something like that. I guess I'm because I don't have the increases library. Don't worry about that. I don't want to confuse you guys with this. So ignore the fact that I use that. But, okay. Anyways, that's, uh, that's your built-in data types and some arithmetic operations. Uh, as you know, there's unary and binary, unary being plus or minus in front of your variables. So if I was to go ahead and say see out um, A, but instead of printing out A, let's print out negative A. You know, let's go ahead and see and do that. You can see it prints out negative five. That's a unary operator because I'm negating whatever that value is. That's I'm doing the inverse of that per se. You can also put a plus, but that won't do anything actually. Like that's just kind of sugarcoating it because there, there's literally nothing that will do. It's already a five and it's just a five. And don't get misled. If I had a negative five in here, if, if A was negative, it's still going to give me a positive, uh, sorry, a negative five. It's not changing it at all. So that plus is not doing anything at all. It's, it's completely useless and only confusing. So I would not put it. If I do put a negative here, then it's going to become a positive because two negatives cancel each other out in that. But the positive, the plus is not doing anything at all. Okay. Don't get confused and think that it's flipping it. Uh, it's not. Okay. So that's the two main unary operators that we have. Uh, and there's, there's two more that I'll talk about. Actually, might as well talk about them now. And those are called pre and post increment. And these get people all the time. Pre increment and post increment. What about double negative in there? Could it be an error? Are you talking about this? Because that's literally what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> uh, that is called pre-decrement. So we have pre-increment and post-increment. And we also have pre-decrement and post-decrement. Now these, for example, is not the same thing as what I was doing with the negatives. That would be more of like this if I was doing it in one line. Uh, that's the unary, you know, flipping it around, whereas pre and post uh, increment and decrement are, are very peculiar shortcuts that are available in C++, but not all languages do them. Uh, let's go ahead and put an example to each of them. So let's go ahead and to, um, let's just comment out a bunch of this so we don't see a bunch of this in the, in the terminal anymore. We can start fresh per se. In fact, now nah, I'll keep it here because this whole arithmetic stuff. So yeah, okay. So I think at this point, let me compile and see what gets printed. Uh, well, obviously that's, that's a problem. 
C math and 6.3. Okay, cool. All right. Um, we can comment out the C math line like that. And then we have a clean. Okay, clean slate. Let's go ahead and put in an integer A, which is equal to 5, and an integer B, which is equal to also 5. And maybe an integer C, which is equal to A. Well, that means it's also equal to 5. Okay? Pre increment is going, is, would be an example of that would be plus plus A. Post increment would be A plus plus. But let's just see plus plus because that sounds cool. Pre decrement is going to be B or minus minus B. And then post decrement is going to be. Let's just do it again, B minus minus. Okay? Those are examples of these. Now, let's actually take a look at each variable and see how each of these affect them. I guess a tip that you should all know, I assume you know, but maybe you don't, uh, is when you highlight text, you can use Control C to copy and then Control V to paste. So uh, if you don't know that, you should. Yeah, I just told you, so make sure you know. Um, yes, here you go. Okay. So this is basically what I just wrote. Uh, we got A, B, and C, and we got post increment, post pre increment, post increment, pre decrement, and post decrement. And let's put some hyphens like that. Yes. Okay. And so uh, let's go ahead and compile. It compiles and we run it. So we get 636. Six. Okay. 636. Six. Yeah. Good. Okay. So let me tell you what each of these do and so that we can better understand why we got 636 out of that. So that's saying that A is equal to 6 after running all these four lines of code, B is equal to 3, and C is equal to 6. Uh, let's look at the first line. What this does is it takes the value of A and adds 1 to it. Uh, an equivalent version of that would be to say A equals A plus 1. That's the same thing as doing this above here. Okay. Similarly, the minus minus B is the same thing as saying B equals B minus one. Those two lines are equivalent. Okay. It's just, I would say, shorthand for that. Uh, because some people want to be lazy and type less. And that's okay. I mean, frankly, when you're trying to do this a lot of times, it comes very convenient. What you have to be careful about is using the other two. The other two, if alone like this, self-contained, the C++ will do the same thing. We'll just add one to the value of C. So in theory, you can kind of think of it as doing this. But the reality is a little bit different than that. Because while, yes, C++ will just add 1 to the value of C, and B minus minus will subtract 1 from the value of B, there's more to it than that. And to do that, we need to add a couple of more variables so that we can see what's happening. So let's add a D and an E. And let me print them out as well. Hopefully they all fit on the screen here. I guess I'll scroll down the, yeah, okay, like that. So we got six and three, six, six, three, six. Uh, the reason is because we had a five here and we incremented it by one, so that gave us a six. Uh, for the C, same, same thing. We started out with a five and we added plus one to it and we got a six. Over here with the B, we started with a five, we subtracted one from it, which is four, and then we subtracted another one, which was three. So that's how we got six, three, six, okay? But now we're still keeping the same thing. But in this case, let's go ahead and set, let's look at the pluses first. Let's make D equals A plus plus, and let's make E equal A plus plus, okay? And so now 
when we go ahead and run this, this is still the same 636 because we haven't modified that. But notice that D and E contain different values. D contains a 6 to it and E contains a 5. However, A contains 6 and C contains 6. So here, as I said, what happened was we started out with a 5, we add 1 to it, so it becomes a 6, and then we assign the value of 6 into D. Okay, so D has a 6 afterwards, and that's why here you see a 6. With E, however, first in here, even though this also increases the value of C by 1, so it goes from 5 to 6, it doesn't copy the value of 6 into E. What happens is it copies the old value of C into E and then does the increment. So really what's happening here is first you take that value of C, so you take that 5 and put it in E, and then after you're done, then you go ahead and you increase the value of C plus 1, which makes it 6. So you're getting the old value of C into E, which is why you're getting a 5 there. That's important to understand, and it's always tricky. That's what, Historically, in 135, that's one of the easiest mistakes people make is to get those flipped. The, the way that I can kind of help you to, to uh, remember that, other than practice, is pre-increment means it's incrementing it before. So before you copy the value out of it, you increment it. Post increment is incrementing it after you copy the value. So after you took the value away from it, then you increase it. So, you, so E gets the old value with post, and whereas pre, pre gets all the incrementing done beforehand. The exact same thing applies with the, with the subtraction ones, which are the decrements. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's use our D and E variables here. So in this case, D is going to, again, because it's using pre-decrement, it should have the, new, the updated value. So even though B starts out with 5, it's going to first go down to 4 and then copy 4 into D. So D should have 4. But E, on the other hand, E is not going to have... Uh, it's not going to have 5 because we already decreased it to 4. But it's actually going to take the value of 4 that is in D, that is in B right now, copy it over to E, and then do the decrement here. So at the end of this, B will have 3 as we saw. It should have 3. But it will turn out that D and E are, guess what, going to have the same values. Uh... I, oh, I forgot to save. That's why. <laughs> there we go. Okay? So both D and E have 4. Again, the logic here, and maybe for that I think we can... Uh, I can draw it here. Maybe that'll help. The logic here is that in memory, somewhere in memory, there's a little square that is the variable of B. And there's a little square... That is the variable of uh, D and E, okay? And so the two lines of code that we have are going to be D equals minus minus B. And then we have E equals B minus minus, okay? And so what happens is you start out with a 5 here and then these have nothing on them. They have garbage. Okay, and so this here is going to be a pre-decrement, which means replace the value of 5 with 5 minus 1, which is 4, and then go ahead and copy that into D. So now D has a 4. So that's this line. For the next line, so now we have 4 four and this still has garbage in it in this case because this is going to be post decrement what's going to end up happening is we are going to go ahead and take the value of four and we're going to copy it into e first before we do anything so this has now four in it and then 
we're gonna do the increment and put it to five. Or, or sorry, what am I? Decrements, so subtractions, so and put it to three. Okay, so instead of four, it becomes three. Okay, but as you can see, E got the old value. So this seems trivial, but people mix it up all the time. And you don't want to do that because it's kind of hard to debug and figure out these kind of typos. There are going to be semantic errors in this case. Um, by the way, the idea of when you're trying to figure out what your code logic is doing and drawing these little squares to represent your variables and your identifiers is very, very useful and very commonly used. So if I give you a piece of code and you're trying to figure out by hand what this code does, you can go ahead and just put the little squares and then line by line modify the contents of the squares and at the end of that you should know what it contains okay so um it's a very useful thing to do i recommend you do it if you're especially because uh, in the uh in the exam i will give you pieces of code and tell you like what does this code do and you can't just plug it in and run it that's why that's why we have skynet running in the background with uh, the spyware and so um you're supposed to by hand work it out like that. So, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using the lockdown browser stuff. We probably won't do that for 202 if you take me for summer two, three with 202, because at that point, we don't need that kind of. But now we do, because now we want to make sure that you actually can understand code, read, and write code. So, yeah. Don't get them mixed. I've seen people mix them and like, oh, like. Even in 302, I saw people mix that. It's kind of sad. Okay. So that's pre and post increment and pre and post decrement. Those are unary operators as well. Okay. Finally, the last operator that I want to talk about is going to be the modulus operator. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, right there. So this is the working space okay so we're gonna talk about modulus and maybe for that I can I can I can uh, do the iPad again first why not I kind of like this because I can draw arrows and emphasize things so modulus this one's a little bit different than math because in math you don't really see it or use it um, I guess you kind of use it a little bit in, uh, in 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 elementary school when you first learn long division or division in general, uh, but but you don't really know it by name. So when you divide something, when I tell you uh, what is two divided by five, you tell me it's two. You could tell me one of two things. You could tell me it's two point five, or you could also tell me you know, if you do your long division, this is four. And please don't don't throw in that, that new math. It's math stuff. All right. I'm doing it the way that I learn it. So you do that. And then you do your little subtraction and you get a one. Okay. Because this one is smaller than this two. That means that you can't divide it further without going into decimals. And we like to call that the remainder. So one of the ways that you can... Uh, that you, you, you can answer this as you can say it's 2.5 or 2 remainder 1. Of course, if you actually wanted to figure out the exact division, uh, what happens is when you do this, you add a 0 here and you add a dot here, and then you do 2 divided by 10, which is 5, and then 2 times 5 is 10, which is 0, and so now the remainder is 0, which means that this is the exact answer, okay? So that's how you would get the decimal equivalents. But either of these are completely accurate. 2.5 or 2 remainder 1 are both perfectly valid answers to the question, what is 2 divided by 5? Okay? Um, I don't think I need to do another example of that because you guys know how to do division, I hope, by hand. The one you don't know how to do, and I never didn't learn either, but like my parents did, is how to do square roots by hand. They do some weird thing where it's like a thing like this and then there's like numbers in here. It's like long division, but like this way, like a mirror version. And they can actually grind out up to a specific decimal that they, they, they so choose to. They can actually grind out how to do a, a, a root, any root, like any root. And I'm like, that's pretty impressive stuff. It's a cool algorithm. Um, 
my dad tried to show it to me once and, and I was like, ah, okay, cool story. But yeah, uh, apparently they learned that in Mexico. It's pretty hardcore. Like, I wish I would have learned that, you know, it'd be impressive. He did teach me a trick for um, how to do the square roots. Or sorry, not how to do the square roots, how to do the uh, powers of, of, uh, of five. Five times five times five and so on. So like five times five is 25 times five is six is 25. And then if you do times five again, you multiply it internally. It's like, I don't want to go off topic here, but I just, this is kind of cool. Um, if you want to multiply this times five again, the trick is you just take these two, put 30, and then you got, I think something like, I think that's how it works. I don't know, it's been a while, but like you, you, you ask him like, what is five times five times five times five times five? And he just answers like that. Or what is six twenty five squared? And he just answers it like that because he knows that algorithm. Uh, and it, there's the task we're doing that. So anyways, that might be a cool assignment. I'll ask him for that formula and then we can make that like a little assignment or I could put that on a test or something. So anyways, we'll make it relevant to the course. So, uh, cause he's, he's around now and he leaves in like two days. So I got two days to learn this from him and create the assignment. So yeah. Okay. So back to division. The whole reason that I'm giving you the spiel is because both of these are perfectly valid answers. So how do we get the remainder one in C++? It turns out that's what the modulus operation do. First of all, the uh, symbol that is used, cause you know, it's math, we need symbols. Uh, you know, addition is a plus and subtraction is a minus, but what is the remainder operation? It turns out that modulus is the most popular and therefore it's the one that C++ uses to indicate uh, modulus uh, operation. And so, Whereas if I do two divided by five like this, and let's say it's 2.0 divided by 5.0, so this way these are, these are both doubles, this of course would give me 2.5. If I just do two divided by five like this, they're both integers, god damn it, what are you doing? Uh, this gives me a two, okay? And so if I wanna have that remainder in this case, so if I'm doing this way and I like to see what the remainder is of that, I can do two, percent five which is read two modulus five or abbreviate it for two mod five go away go. there i don't know i think she wanted to leave so sorry all right so uh yeah so this is read as two mod five and what this means is get the remainder of that division so Go ahead and do this division and then get find that value. And of course, this would be one, okay? That's how modulus works. So if you're trying to do division with remainders, you can use integer division plus modulus and get your value. So if I was to ask you uh, to divide two by uh, 11, for example, well, nah, we already did two, so maybe let's do a three. Three by 11. You know, three times three is nine. So put nine there, you get a remainder of two. So if I was to do uh, three by 11, this would give me a nine. Wait, what? That's not, sorry. I, 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 uh, I was skipping ahead. This is three here, not nine. And then this is a nine here, which then gives you uh, two. So that would give you a three there. And then, um, if you were to do the modulus of that, so three mod 11, that would give you the remainder, which is two, okay? So you would think like, oh, well, when am I ever gonna really use modulus? Yeah, yeah, it's late at night, I'm sorry. That's what, that's what I meant, sorry. I'm glad I have you guys here. This is okay, but I don't know. I read it wrong, so I just copied over. So, anyways, yes. Thank you, thank you for reminding me of that. Because let's actually do that. What if we did three divided by eleven, or like that? Well, then that would actually be drawn like this, right? In this case, it would actually be zero here, and the three would be a remainder. So, if I was to do as I had it before, three divided by eleven, this would give me a zero. 
and then 3 mod 11 would give me a 3 okay so thank you thank you for uh, reminding me about that so you would ask yourself well when do I ever really want this I want decimals it turns out that it's super modulus is a super 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 useful thing for like the, the most random things you would think of it just comes in useful uh, first of all, it's a, it's very important in some uh, encryption and security algorithms. Like, they use modulus to to encrypt uh, keys or to decrypt them. Uh, RSA and all these algorithms do that. Uh, but at a simpler 135 level, one very very yeah hashing. One very very hashing is all about modulus, but. One and you learn that in Trail too. But one very, very, very good usage of uh, modulus is for detecting whether a number is odd or even. So, how do I do that? I can just use mod two. So, if I want to do something like twenty-two mod two, or simply x mod two, if x mod two is equal to zero, that means that X is an even number. If it's equal to one, it means it's an odd number. Because like, for example, 22 mod two is 22 is basically saying what is uh, 22 divided by two, which is 11, but the remainder is zero. So this would give us zero. Whereas if it was like 21, well, if we do 21 divided by two, it's going to be uh, 10 and a remainder of one. So modulus is very useful for detecting whether something is odd or even. And then you are absolutely correct that it is also very useful for random number generation. Because with your RNGs, uh, which I'll show you the most basic one, how to do random number generation in C++, you can generate a random number between like, let's say one and a thousand. But you, if you're just dealing with a dice, as you said, you only really want numbers from one through six. So you can use modulus to uh, figure out what that number should be that you want to that, that you want the dice to roll to, even though your RNG is giving you a bigger range, you can use modulus to sort of cut that range down to the range that you are looking for. If you only wanted, if you had a set, if you wanted to have a, a seven uh, seven face dice, you could do that by doing mod seven. Okay, so uh, how RNG works is if I ask you pick a number between one and a thousand, you would pick fifty five. Like I just picked that randomly. And if you were trying to see what that would be in your dice, it would be basically 55 mod 6. Uh, what is that? I don't know. But let's go ahead and try it out on the computer. So if I do 55 mod 6 and I do C out. And while I'm at it, let's also do the division. Okay, I'm curious what 55 divided by 6 is as well. And if you go ahead and run that, it says 9 remainder 1. We just got it at the same time that you set it to. So who was faster, the human or the machine, I guess? <laughs> of course, these are easy numbers, but you go much higher, then of course you don't want to do that by hand. And so, yeah. Uh, that means that our dice would have rolled a one between one and six. You'll never get a number here that is actually the, the way that I have it now you get from zero to five. Uh, so you have to say zero is technically your one. So if you want to solve that issue, you can add plus one here to this. And now you'll get a range from one to six. So technically you rolled a two. Uh, let's say the next time you roll around, you get five, five, five in your RNG, because it's between 1 and 1,000. It turns out you rolled a 2 again. All right, the next time you get 566. It turns out that you rolled a 2 again. Oh, <laughs> it's because I have the same number here. <laughs> Let's use a variable. Yeah, I was like, there's no way. We, we're not that lucky. I know it's Vegas, but we're not that lucky. So let's go ahead and uh, do it this way. All right, we rolled a three. So now what if we do five, five, five here in the RNG? 
we rolled a four. All right. Let's do that. We rolled a four again. Let's do eight, nine, seven. Now. We rolled a four again. Okay. If we roll again the four, then then I guess we uh we should go to the, to the casinos. Ah, oh, we rolled a one. We would have lost all everything. So, there you go. Okay. So uh, how do you make this random? It turns out that there is a function called rand, which which I'll show you sometime. Not today, because I want to get to the if statement stuff. But it is a uh, it's definitely a, a, a useful, very very useful way of randomly generating stuff. Very useful when you're making games and things like that, uh, and so on. So, yeah, okay. So that's modulus basically. Uh, very very useful. As the class goes on, you will see some uses of it. But just checking whether it's odd or even a number is a very very useful uh, and powerful thing that you can do. Okay. So, all right. That's all the arithmetic operators. And uh, don't use modulus with, with, with doubles. Use strictly ints there, okay? And the results will be ints. Modulus can only be used with integers, okay? Uh, I guess one more thing I, I, ha I have no tier for is the following. There is parentheses in math for order of operations. Same thing applies in C++ for order of operations. So, um, it, you know, if we go ahead and let's go ahead and uh, let's make a new program at this point. I'm not going to say the word program anymore. Too much effort. Okay. Using name space std autocorrect int main return zero. As always, you need to have everything like that. So we'll call this math is fun. Okay, and let's go ahead and declare some variables a, b, c, and d. Okay, and maybe we give five and four, and maybe three. So you can do, you know, the basic stuff that I did like this, but you can also use parentheses to indicate order of operations because suppose that I have this. In that order of operations is the highest thing is of course parentheses and from there do we have an issue oh we have recognition successful that sounds scary we're still online are we yeah okay so it's lagging yeah i think we had a yeah i think i think we had a a, a slight hiccup but this one was different than normal because it said something was in my computer Give me a warning about it. Um, interesting. It said OBS reconnection successfully. Hmm. I don't know. Anyways, I guess we're back now. So yeah, that was that was a different one. I think that was like a real. I think that was a hiccup within my system than the internet actually. I don't know. Interesting. Or the router or something. But we're back up now. So yeah. Hopefully all the ads have stopped playing. Get ad block. You don't don't watch ads. I don't even get money from that. I don't think I do. And if I do, it's probably like a like a penny. So <laughs> it's not worth it. So yeah, okay. All right. So in math, we have the following, okay? Uh, we have order of operation, which says parentheses come first, then exponents, then multiplication and division. And then at the lowest tier, we have addition and subtraction, okay? So, and then of course, somewhere in there are unaries as well. Uh, that would be under the uh, the uh, the exponent side. So, if I have the following line of code, if I say d is equal to uh, a times b plus c, and I go ahead and print out d, you know, what is that going to be? That's going to be a times b plus c, which means five times four plus three. 
So that should be 23. Okay. Um, it's called fourth now, so I want to make sure you're on the right one. Twenty-three. Okay, that's what we expected to get. Maybe you want to add an end line there to make it easier to read. Cool. Let's go ahead and flip them around. Let's put the plus here and the times there. In this case, order of operations dictates that I have to do the multiplication first and then the addition. So in this case, I should get four times three, which is 12, and then add five to that, which is gonna give me 17. And I do. What if I want the addition to happen first? Well, just like in math, I go ahead and use parentheses like that. And again, the spacing doesn't matter. You could squish this all together. You could also space it out like that. That's okay. If I do that, it's going to give me 27 because it's going to go ahead and do a plus B, which is nine, and then multiply it times three, which is 27. Okay. So order of operation works the same way that it works in math. And I could put extra parentheses here, but they're not going to do anything. They're redundant. Okay. Just like I could in math and theory. Now, if my parentheses are off, if I have one too many or one too few, I'm going to get an error saying that it expected a parentheses, but it didn't see one. And so what the heck is going on, basically? OK, um, I could, of course, nest this into even more parentheses fun like this. If I wanted to do something like divided by two. OK, so in this case, I'm saying to go ahead and multiply this together and then do the division. That's giving me 13 because it's going to be uh, 27 divided by 2 is going to be, well, 13 apparently, 0. 0.5. If I want to see that 0. 0.5, I can switch this to modulus and see the 1. Okay, now what if I go ahead and get rid of this? Where does modulus fall in that category? I'm still getting a one. Modulus is kind of in the uh, in the. I have a list here, but I think it's around the plus and minus category of order of operations. If I do it this way, now I'm going to get a nine because uh, three mod two is going to be one, and then of course five plus four is nine. Nine times one is just one. Okay, so you go from left to right. And then you also follow order of operations. Um, there should be a list somewhere in the book that has all the order of operations there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, order of operations. Make sure you know it. Uh, otherwise, you will get unexpected results. What else? What else? Uh, let's talk about coercion finally. So the, when you do something like, uh, like this, or let's just put it in D, let's make an E, how about that? Yeah, let's make an E. And E equals 5.4 times, or here, no, let's do, let's do double E equals 5.4 divided by two. Okay. Well, five divided by two like that. Of course, we get. Well, we can't see it. Um, but it's two, right? Because five divided by two is two point five, but we lose the point five. Okay. The solution to keep it is we could, of course, make five five point zero, like that. Or if it's a variable, like say. Uh, a is five, so we can just literally put in five in here. You know, if we do that, we're still going to get just the same value of two, but we could change this to a double to guarantee that that division is going to have accuracy. The other thing that we can do is what is known as casting. Okay, you can cast values in C plus plus. Now, what is casting? All right, type casting is the explicit conversion of a value from one data type to another. Okay? 
And so what that means is I can cast one data type to another data type within a certain uh, limitation. It has to be a valid cast. Uh, I can't cast a string into an integer because I can't, what does it mean to cast the word hello into a number? That doesn't really make sense to the computer. Uh, therefore, you're not allowed to do it unless you do some sort of uh, magic in 202 for that, okay? So, how do you cast? There's two ways to cast. One of them is the old school OG uh, way, which is the C way, which is to write the uh, data type and then put it in parentheses, kind of like a function, okay? So if I do that, I've now casted A into a double. Now that cast, is, this doesn't mean I'm changing permanently A. It's only for this operation right here. And notice that if I go ahead and do this, now I'm getting 2.5 because now one of these two uh, numbers that are in the division is a double. That allows you to, uh, to, to, to cast things so that you can have accuracy if you're trying to go for that. If you do this, however, notice you get a two. That's because you do the casting after the division has happened and you already lost the precision. So you need to do the casting before, as such is the case, okay? So that's casting. Uh, the other way that you can cast is you can do double G. So let's say double G is gonna be uh, B divided by C, okay? You can do what is known as a static cast. Put the type in here, which is double and then put it in parentheses again. And then if we were to see out G here, you can see it's 1.33, not just one, okay? Both, these, both of these forms of casting are identical for all sense of purposes now. Uh, however, this is the C way to do it. Like I said on day one or day two, uh, we're learning C++, but really we're learning C because we're not learning all the cool things about C++. You get to learn those in 202 and later on. Some of them you probably never get to learn. You got to learn on your own. But uh, that's the C way of casting. This is the C++ way of casting. And there's a lot of stuff happening in this line that you're not even going to learn into 202. The fact that we're using the less than and greater than sign like this is the first time you see that used. And you're like, what the heck is that? That's known as a template. That's something we cover like a month into 202 uh, in, the, in the fall. So in the summer, it'd be like a week and a half or two weeks. I don't know. Uh, and the fact that this is a static cast versus a dynamic cast versus a reinterpret cast is something that we also cover in 202 when we talk about pointers. So a lot of things are happening here that you're not going to see until 202. So this is one of those like, oh, let me just memorize it, which is why I personally only used to show this one. But I do know that Sally, Sally, <laughs> that Dolly is showing this one. So I thought I'd show you both. So you know that they exist, but do know that there's a lot of stuff happening here in this line of code that makes it be that way. Uh, and you won't even get to see that until 202. But that's how you cast things. Uh, that, and, and casting again is the explicit conversion. By explicit, it means that you as a programmer are doing that cast explicitly so you're doing it like you're actually typing it and you're doing it intentionally there is another way of of uh of changing data types and that is called type coercion type coercion is the implicit so automatic another way of saying it conversion of a value from one data type to another okay so that means that's not one you control. That's one that the compiler will do for you on a per need basis per se, okay? So when does that happen? I've done that already. Uh, when, when I go ahead and I create int a, suppose I did 5.3. A is an integer. It cannot hold decimals, but 5.3 is technically a double. Or if I put an F here, now it's a float. Either of those contain decimals, but you cannot hold decimals in an integer. So the act of dropping the, the, the uh, 
of dropping the decimal is known as coercion because it's converting it from a double into an integer. Technically here, before I did the casting, when it was, uh, when it was doing the division, and then it was trying to store that into, uh, into the double, when it did the division, it lost the position. That, I could say you could say that's kind of coercion as well. Mm, is it? Not really, because the division happens with integers. I don't know. I guess the result is a division that gets lost. So I don't know. That's a questionable one. But this is a lot easier one to see. That one right there. Okay? Uh, similarly, if here this was not a double, if this was an integer, and then we actually took the time to do the casting here, it still got coerced back to an integer because you couldn't keep it. So typically coercion happens when you, you can't keep something in something else. Uh, in theory, if I do something like double uh, Z equals four point, uh, just five actually, I guess this is kind of like coercion because five is an integer and now it became a double, but uh, that's not really that relevant. I think the big one is this one. You have to be careful about coercion because that's how you lose accuracy. Uh, it's automatic because if it doesn't do that, then it doesn't know what to do with the number. It has an error. But you got to be careful about it. You got to make sure that if it's happening, it's something you intended to do. Because otherwise, you're probably losing some kind of precision. So, uh, yeah. That's casting and coercion. Um, now I can I can show you that if I can come up with it. It's kind of tricky, but I'll try my best. No, no, I still can't come up with it because we don't know if statements yet. So that's never mind. That one example where I compare a float and a double and they're not the same, even though they have the same number or it looks like they do. Uh, and they have the I actually have that somewhere in here, so that's okay. We'll do that on Monday or something. But okay. Um, all right, so that's casting and coercion. We talked about auto operations. Um, I have a I have a definition here called mixed type expressions, which is an expression that contains operands of different types. What that means is just kind of what we've been doing. Suppose that you, you're trying to do an addition between an integer and a double. So let's say you're doing 6 minus 1.5. The answer is going to be 4.5 because, again, if one of them is a double, then what is happening is the integer kind of gets coerced, actually, into a double, and then this, the uh, subtraction can happen. So if I do something like uh, double z is equal to 6, minus 1.5 this subtraction is taking an integer and a double the integer gets upgraded to a double internally the subtraction happens and then 4.5 gets stored in here if this was an integer then you'd still have that same process you would do 6 to a double then you do the subtraction and then they get coerced again but this time to an int and then stored if it was an int z Okay, so uh, the kind of practice that you should do is of that is make sure that you know, that, it, that if, if you're given a long line of code, like literally this, but like with like 10 variables and it's just really, really long, you want to make sure you keep track of when things become double and when they they, they, uh, they retain integers. Because like here's a Here's, a, here's an example of that, of, 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 of me trying to be tricky, I suppose. Uh, double GG gets 6 plus 5.5 minus 4 divided by 2 times 3.1. What is that going to give us? Okay. Well, what is going to happen first? Is this division going to happen first or is this multiplication going to happen first? And it matters because here's the thing. This division is between two integers. That's going to give me an integer. Okay? In fact, maybe to make that a little bit more tricky, make it a 5. Because that would, that would give me, that could give me 2.5 or it could give me 2. 
depending on what it, five and two are considered. You know, if if they're considered uh, if they're considered integers, then you're going to get an integer back. But if either of them is considered a, a double or a float, then you're going to get a decimal back, and that's going to change everything else, right? Uh, how could this become one of these two could become a float? Well, here's the thing: this is this operation would become a float. So this one would give me 6.2, which would then 5 divided by 6.2 would give me a decimal. And so this is where it becomes kind of tricky, right? Um, so let's go ahead and plug it in and then analyze what the answer is. Did I save it? No, I didn't. Let me try to compile it again. Uh, it would help if we print it out, actually, because then we can see what's happening. Otherwise, we just have to imagine. You'll just have to imagine the fire. All right. So uh, 5.3. We got 5.3. So let's just try and do it uh, where we first assume that the division happens in the multiplication. And let's see if we get the right answer. Okay. So 5 divided by 2 is equal to just 2 because it's integer division. No 2.5. And then we multiply times 3.1. And that would give us uh, 6.2. And then we now have basically 6 minus 5.5, uh, or sorry, 6 plus 5.5 .5 minus 6.2. In this case, it doesn't really matter, but let's just say we do the, let's go ahead and try to do the subtraction. No, let's do the addition first, so we don't deal with negatives. Uh, this would give me 11.5, and then minus 6.2 would give me back to here 5.3 okay and that's actually I think what we got yeah so that's how this is happening right okay but mathematically uh, if I was to write this in, in in here you know what we're doing is we're doing 6 plus 5.5 .5 minus 5 divided by 2 times 3.1 now because of order of operations this has to go like this right that's pretty much what's happening here now mathematically um, there is no priority between doing this operation and doing this operation both should give me the same answer in math. However, in C++, they won't because this is integer division. And if I do this first, then this will no longer be integer division because that will be a division of that. And so here it matters. You got to be very careful about this because you probably want to have an accurate result, which means you want to cast one of these to a double to avoid any potential issues. Okay? So, if I do this, now I'm going to get an accurate result, which will be 3.75. Okay? So, it's a little bit tricky when you get these longer ones to figure out what the answer is because you got to keep track of when things are integers and when they're doubles. So, uh, furthermore, Suppose that I go and do something like that. In this case, again, this will give us 0.5, which will be a double, and then you don't need to do any casting because the rest of this will be maintained as a double. So be careful, all right? You, you're going to have to practice doing these by hand and comparing the result in the computer. Okay, so that concludes Chapter 3. From there, we're going to go into uh, Chapter 4. Yeah, chapter four is pretty easy, pretty short. We'll do that in like 10 minutes, hopefully. I hope. Then we can jump into if statements. So uh, we kind of already touched on chapter... Uh, oh, oh and there's more to chapter three, actually. Um, but we already covered it. We covered functions, value returning functions. Uh, I guess one definition that I will, that I kind of want to make sure that I give. Um, by the way, I was showing the plus and the minus, but I never switched to here. 
but I was saying that you want to add a double here. So the way that we had this before was like this, right? And then you need to make a double here like that, right? Or if you add parentheses here, then you don't need to do that. But then this operation will happen first, okay? So anyways, um, back to the to this though, a couple of things that, that, um, that I wanna point out just so we can completely finish chapter uh, chapter three is this over here, IO stream and the include, uh, this is called, what well, we said, the include part is a preprocessor uh, directive. IO stream itself, we call that a library, okay? And IO stream is actually the standard library. It's a set of pre-written functions, data types, and other items. So um, let me write that down for you guys. Just so that we can just be uh, be done with this chapter, I think. So the C++ standard library, which is your IO stream, not uppercase. I just wrote it uppercase, but don't do it uppercase. And uh, any library or functions in the library are divided into header files. And you'll cover more about header files in uh, 202 making them. But for now, you want to include the header file that is part of the, the, the functions that you're trying to do. Because like the entire C++ standard library is split into more than just IO stream. Like I guess you could say C math is also part of that. Okay. So however, including it is making your code more complicated because including it literally means including it as in like taking the code that somebody else wrote and throwing it into your program. So now your 10 line of codes program that says hello world and then multiplies two numbers and then see out something isn't really just 10 lines. Internally, it had to pull a bunch of library functions to get that running and it's like, 20,000 lines of code and you only wrote 10 but internally all of that had to be added in to get things working and that's okay so you can say that you've written thousands of lines of code now no but you can say that you've you've written programs that take thousands of lines of codes to run at this point you can you can tell that to your friends and family <laughs> so anyways we call these header files uh or 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 also just uh libraries and so this is the, the math library and this is the IO stream library. And anytime that you want to use them, as you saw here, you include them at the top of your program using the preprocessor directive. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much just, just the formality of defining what that is. Uh, there are other ones that we, uh, so I showed you power, I showed you square root. There's also a useful one, which is absolute value. Um, there's two of them actually for absolute value, I think. There's just, there's ABS X, and I think there's F ABS X. And so this one is for um, integers. And then this one is for floating point uh, expressions. And of course the input is a number and then the output is the absolute value of that number. Absolute value means that you get a positive number that is equivalent to that. So if you feed it 55, it gives you 55. But if you feed it negative 55, it's gonna give you back 55. Very useful uh, operation in math. Uh, however, this one up here is not part of the CMath library. It's actually a part of one of the C libraries. So if you wanna use that one, you'd have to put at the top of your program include and then right there, you would put CSTDLib, spelled like that. And that allows you to use this function. If you don't put it in, it's going to ask you what this APS variable is that you never declare. So uh, there's that. Uh, let's talk about the string. So we talked about the string library, right? That one you include by putting the word string here. Um, there, there's two very useful... Uh, functions in the string library and there's a lot more well, there's tons of useful ones but there's one that i just want to show you really fast uh when you click when you declare a string string a equals high or hello i guess i don't know it just came out like that 
you can check the size or the length of uh, characters in the string by using the size function. And the size function, it would be kind of different than the ones above because it's actually object oriented programming and blah, 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 202 stuff. But you actually have to use the variable name, then you put a dot, like a period, and then you can either use the length function or also the size function. And I do believe they both give you back the same result. And then you can store this maybe like in an integer. Different ones, for you know, if you want to see that. Or you can just see out it. This will return to you the length. So in this case, the length would be, I guess, um, I don't know, let's try. Because I don't know if this is including the null terminator, but I don't think it's, it's no. Uh, string ggg equals hello and then see out a dot length and let's see out and then maybe uh, let's put a space after that and then hey dot length oh my gosh g dot length okay We got five, five. So it counted five, and there are indeed five characters. So it's not counting the null terminator at the end. That's good, it's only counting the characters that we see. Uh, if I added a space at the end though, then it would be six actually. That was weird. There you go, six, six. Okay, you can see both are returning the same thing. Uh, don't worry too much about what this dot is. And I know this is weird because you haven't ever seen a function like that. Uh, and, and then you're like, why is this dot? We will talk about that dot. That dot, by the way, is called the member access operator. And when we talk about structs at the end of the semester, so in, a, in four weeks or whatever, then uh, then I will introduce you to the member access, member access operator and how that works. And uh, you learn more about this in 202 uh, when you talk about objects and functions within classes and all these fancy terms that you don't know okay but for now know that if you want to get the length of a string you can do it this way and this is part of the string library as well notice that i didn't include string again right but again that's because uh the compiler is really friendly with us about that it's not so friendly with the cmat stuff i think with the cmat stuff if i just try to go in here and throw in like int a gets abs or let's do f abs first of 55 5.5 .5. then uh oh if this was five because this expects a float that is coercion happening there but yeah fast was not declaring this scope so i would need to include here manually cmat so whereas the string one the compiler is a homie it's not a homie with the other libraries ah now it's complaining about this so let's just go with gggg Okay, and nothing happened because we never see out of it, but if you want to see out of it instead of storing it somewhere, we can do that as well. All right, so we get five. The absolute value of five is five. The absolute value of negative five, which is 5.1, or 5.2, I guess, is just 5.2, okay? So now you wanna use the abs one. That one is not in CMAT, but it worked. Did I save it? Yeah, I did. And yet, it works. See that? So in this one, again, the compiler is being a homie. It's letting me use it, even though technically it's in the include CSTD lib library. Okay? Uh, oh, yeah, here you go. Thanks. So as you can see, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. So be careful about that. Be, uh, be very, very careful about it. Just include the library calls, the library header uh, files to not avoid any potential risks of uh, the code not working somewhere else and do it right, you know? So again, with apps, you know, it's gonna give me five even though I give negative five, but I didn't need to include this and it still worked just okay. Like there was no problem with that one. It was uh, it was cool about that. Maybe it's in the IO stream too, I'm not sure. But with the F apps, 
That one, you know, right now it works because I have the uh, the CMAT library. But if I go ahead and not include that one, then it gives me an error because this is not declared in the scope. So as you can see, some work, some don't work. So user beware. Okay. So uh, yes, that's 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 the thing about libraries and header files. So yes. Now let's go ahead and finally start talking about. I want to sneeze. The uh, interactive input. So yay, interactive input. Uh, okay. So right now you know how to write stuff like how to post things, like how to print to the screen. But a very, very useful thing to do in programs is to interact with users by taking information from them. So we want to be able to not just print stuff out, but also read things in. Okay. So we want to have what's known as input. Now, what is input? Well, input is the process of getting values from outside the program into variables. Okay. So input is the process of getting the person's variable into your little boxes that you've been making, okay? So if this person has a five and he wants to put a five inside of B, this process of being able to put it inside the computer of B is known as input. And for that, we're gonna use not C out, but C in. So you guys get it? C out is for output, C in is for input. So they, it's not rocket science. They came up with these names to uh, hopefully try to make it easy to remember. So yeah. So C in is a variable declared in our IO stream library. That represents the default input source which is usually the keyboard and in the terminal okay now remember this guy that's the insertion operator you, you use it to send stuff to see out which then puts it out in the terminal now we're gonna use this very cool sounding special ops extraction operator it will perform all necessary extractions. All right, so that's just the backwards one. So the extraction operator is used to get data from the input source and store it into variables, okay? Uh, and not just that, but in order to make our lives easier, it does skip what is known as white space. So that's all the spaces between stuff. Uh, it also skips line feeds. That is included when, when somebody says white space, it includes spaces like normal spaces or, or enters or line feeds. So if you, uh, if you were to feed an input that has spaces and or enters, it will, uh, it will not read those in. It will just read anything that's not a space, which is useful to us. Because like if we want to read a number in, you pr usually type in the number and then you press enter to, to send it. You don't want that ender part to be kept, that return. Uh, we saw in the ASCII table that's, a, that's, an actual, uh, that's an actual character in there, a number in there, it's like 10 or something. We don't want to keep that. We only want to keep the value. So it does skip that. So the syntax, you know, for using it is going to be cn and then the variable that you're going to store it into and your semicolon later on in 202 you will learn that you can overload this uh to to do more than just that also when we talk about file streams you will see that you don't have to always use cn you can make your own this is just an io stream variable so we'll talk about that when the time comes but for now 
just see and see out is good and you can do that and what this is going to do is this is going to get the next value from the input source um, which again is the terminal what you're typing in it's going to extract it from the terminal and it's going to store it in your variable okay uh, having that allows you to basically do what is known as interactive input and if there is one thing that I think we all know is if something is not interactive it's boring because you're not involved in the process and therefore you don't need to be involved in while you're there your brain is like I'm not doing anything I'm gonna shut down I don't I can rest at this time because I'm not involved and so that's why you know with games or any learning stuff it's supposed to be interactive a back and forth conversation right and so interactive input is very important in a program to make it interesting and also to make it useful uh, because other time if you if a program does the exact same thing every time you run it then what's the point of you of, of actually having a program why not just literally like write the exact output every single time and just run it uh, if you're just trying to do math computations uh, and you're hard coding them then you can just save the answers once and not ever run it again, right? You want to be able to have the interactivity of changing the inputs so that the outputs change. So like in a calculator, right? A little paper calculator or paper, like a little hand calculator, the input you're, you're giving in, that's interactive. It changes every single time you run it because you give it different numbers or you don't, you don't. But the point is you have that choice. The calculator doesn't decide what it's going to add and subtract. You decide. You tell it what to do. You show it who's the bat, who's the boss, right? You tell Skynet who's who's boss. So, uh, a definition for an interactive program. Since you know, I think you understand what that is, but I'll give you the book definition. Is basically a program which the user. communicates directly with the computer okay and then how, how do we call something when you're asking the user to enter something we like to say we are prompting the user so a prompt is a message displayed to the screen or the terminal which is in your screen ideally explaining what the user is expected to answer or to input so if you just tell the user like yo enter a number and then you do stuff with that number you know you got to tell him what that stuff is like enter a number to add enter a number to multiply you know and if you look at, again we go back to the calculator example the reason why it doesn't prompt you is because at the top of the calculator it says like ti83 calculator or something right so you you know that it is expecting a number then an uh, which is an operand then an operator something like a plus or a minus and another operand and it's going to do the computation right that's because you know that it's a calculator right but what if what if you don't know what this program does? In, a, in, in that case, you want to prompt it to be clear. Like in assignment two, uh, there's like computations of where you need like the radius and the alpha and all this stuff. So for that, you want to make sure that you're clear which values you're accessing from the user. So if you're trying to calculate the radius of a circle, you need to know the radius of it, right? Or sorry, if you're trying to calculate the area of a circle, you need the radius because it's pi r squared. You don't need to ask the user what pi is. You can make that a constant because you know what that's going to be. That's not going to change. Radius is going to change. So instead of just simply running your program and then, and then it just being a white screen where you just are expected to press a number in, you can be friendly and say, you know, good fine evening, gentlemen. May I please have the value that you wish to store as the radius of the circle that you want me to calculate the area of? Thank you and have a lovely day. You know, that's much nicer, and I feel like I should be drinking tea now, okay? So that is what we say when we're prompting the user. And usually a prompt uh, should precede the input, the, the input statement. A 
I cannot spell proceed. Oh. Proceed. The input statement. Okay. So first you're gonna see out that good fine evening gentleman thing, and then uh, that's from Django and Chain. And then you're and then you're gonna go ahead and see in into the the variable that you're storing uh, so the radius and then sometimes this isn't necessary but there is a concept of echo printing echo printing is basically to display the value after the user has entered it so that you can so that they can verify that they enter it correctly uh most of the time you will see in in in, in the in the program that it shows them the terminal after you enter it this is more useful for when you're entering multiple values and you want to make sure that the user can see that they didn't make a mistake in entering them in different order. Like, for example, if you're prompting more than one value at a time, like let's say it asks you enter the length and width to calculate the area of this rectangle. And, and then it's just two, two, two numbers that it's expecting uh, just to, so that, you know, the user knows that he didn't put them backwards in you could echo them out. So echo printing is useful for that regard. That's it, that's all there is about interactive input. Now all that remains is for me to actually show you an example in code so that uh, you become comfortable with it. And that'll be, that'll at least complete the ability to do assignment two. So uh, yes, let's go ahead and uh, do it here. Okay, now let's do another program. So pick a pick a topic of something that you want me to do for this interactive input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. That should be because right now I'm not doing anything. I'm just. Uh, I'm creating the basic program. Which game to play? All right, that works. All right, so we are going to go ahead and store the name of the game that a user wants to play and how long he wants to play it for, okay? So we write a comment saying, this program will Store the name of a game he will play and then or not store but ask I suppose ask and store ask and store the name of the game uh, he or she will play and then uh, will ask and store how many hours he or she will play it I always say he for everything, by the way. That's because I'm Hispanic and in Mexico, everything just gets put with a male pretense in front of it. So it's just a bad habit, but you know, I'm he or she, you know, there's there's girl gamers and guy gamers, you know, stuff like this. I'm not trying to make a statement about that, but yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, all right. So let's prompt the user. And first, actually, first, let's go ahead and declare the variables that we're going to do. So we're going to call two variables. This time, we're going to try to make meaningful names. So we're going to call one of them name, or maybe G name for game name. And then, and maybe because of that, I'll make this the uppercase. And then we're going to have an integer because it makes sense that for hours, we want to store it as a number. We don't need to have double because we're not going to expect them to enter like decimals, like 5.5 hours. We're going to keep it strictly to... Uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to whole numbers. In fact, it would be cool if how many hours and minutes he or she will play. How about that, yeah. So then we can have an hours and a minutes, okay? In fact, we'll ask him for minutes and then we can convert it. Nah, we need more math for that. We'll, we'll say it like that. We need the statements for this. It's kind of hard to not use this statements. Okay, so we'll do that. Because we're good programmers, we're going to initialize our variables to something. In this case, for this one, we can just do unknown game name or something. And these to zero, okay? So, we're ready. So now we can say, uh, greetings, comrades. Comrade, because it's a single person. Uh, what game 
thou wishes to play today. Toronto prompt. It's it's uh it's neutral. That way we're, we we uh, we make it as, as friendly as possible. Uh, we're not trying to specify anything about the user's name or age or gender or anything actually. Just just literally the most neutral thing possible, right? Because that's the thing. When you're programming, you got to think about your user base. And if you don't know what that is, then you want to make it as, as, as friendly and neutral as possible. If you say like, hey, dude, oh, dude, is a, dude is also working for everything. But like if you say, hey, guy, what game are you playing? And then a girl is running your program or a woman, you know, then, uh, you know, she, might, she, she may be like, hey, that's not cool. Uh, so you 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 gotta be careful about these things uh, because you want it to be friendly. You know you gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta make your program friendly uh, because it's appealing. And if it's not, then you know people don't like your program. So yeah. All right. So comrade, I guess is is, is good because it's, it's a neutral. So okay. So now we're gonna use cn and we're gonna read in the name of the uh, game. So in this case, because cn ignores white space. It does stop reading after white space. So this will only work for single um, single word names of games. I will show you how to use get line later. In fact, maybe if we have enough time, I can show it to you today, which allows you to read uh, more than just uh, single words to, to actually read an entire line, okay? So we can say G name, C in G name, okay? And then we will have our echo printing, but it's not just gonna be printing out the name. We'll say it in a much nicer way, like uh, C out G name, and then maybe a question mark. That's a wonderful choice to make. Um, and then we can actually kind of combine the echo printing with the next prompt. We can say, uh, how long do you intend to play today? Do you intend to play this exquisite game today? And now we kind of made it too wide, so we can go ahead and do that. This tabbing doesn't is not required, but it makes it look nicer. You could also, if you don't like splitting things like that, you could also do it like this, and then do that. Uh, anyways, there's your prompt. Echo and prompt at the same time. And now we can say CN. Maybe instead of how long, how many hours? So we can say C in hour. And then um, if you were to ask for minutes, let's not ask for minutes right now. So I want to get to the get line and we have 10 minutes. So yeah, okay. And then your echo printing can be like, wonderful. Have fun and see you in Hour, hours. So that's going to print out the number and so on. Don't forget the end of line at line four. Uh, you don't really need one here because we want it to print out in the same spot. So how about this? I'll show you one with and one without. So in this one, we're not, you know, I, I know that I added this one intentionally. But, uh, oh, this one, yeah, the semicolon, yes. But this one, we don't have an end line, okay? So this one, you'll see that you'll enter it in the next line. This will enter in the same line. However, we will want to, uh... okay, well, let's just do it like this. We can format it afterwards, actually. This is, this is a good practice. This is called fifth. All right, so greetings, comrade. What game do I wish to play today? And as you can see, it's prompting me on the next line. So I'm going to go ahead and put Valorant. Press enter, and then it echoes and says, Valorant, that's a wonderful choice to make. How many hours do you intend to play this exquisite game today? I hope that's how you spell exquisite. And as you can see this time, because there's no end line, it's prompting me to enter it in the same line versus a different line. So I'm going to put in here two all right and then i can press enter and it says wonderful have fun and see you in two hours and voila you just had your first little mini ai prompt you 
what game you want to play. So questions about that? Anything? Puppy. However, let me show you a problem with this. Multi-space stuff. So let's say I put a counter strike like this, okay? There's a space. Now guess what happened here? Here it said counter. That's a wonderful choice to make. How many hours have you been playing to play this exquisite game today? Wonderful. Have fun and see you in zero hours. You're like, what the heck? What happened? You know, like I was expecting to see uh, the to, for to ask me. It didn't even ask me for that. Well, what happened is this: CN only takes in one word, uh, and it's it stops when it sees a space or a line feed because it ignores those. And so what ends up happening is counter is read into your string variable that contains the game of the name, but then the strike part is actually read into the uh, into the into the number, into the hours. And because it's not valid, it's just kind of uh, throwing it away and skipping it and not reading anything in. And if we had initialized uh, hours, we'd actually would have ended up with some garbage in there. And so, uh, if you if 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 that's a situation that you want to avoid, then CN as it is is not enough to actually uh, do this. For that, you can use get line. So let's go ahead and go use get line. So get line is a function part of I believe I I O stream. And the way it works is it takes two parameters, so kind of like power, base, and exponent. In this case, the first parameter is an IO stream per, per, uh, variable, which in this case is CN. And then the second one is where you want to store the uh, input to. So you do basically just that get CN, uh, get line CN G name. And now what get line is going to do is it's going to read all of the input all the way until it sees a delimiter character. A delimiter stands for a special character which indicates to stop reading. Whereas with CN, it, it, that's a space or a line feed, with get line, you get to manually specify what you want that to be. By default, it's, a, it's an enter. But you can, by putting a third parameter here, specify a, a character that you wish. So that would be like the default, but uh, and as you can see here, it says card the limb. You could also do a comma, so it stops reading after a comma. Um, that's actually how, uh, once you get to the Twitter assignment, I, I, I read in all the tweets because they're comma separated, because it's a comma separate file. We'll get to that at some point, but that's useful then. So that's why I'm showing you this now. It'll come in useful later on when you get to that assignment. Uh, so now, let's try it again. This time, let's again put a two word name. So this time we're gonna say, uh, I will counter strike, right? Counter-Strike. Okay, this time you can see that it read it in successfully, asked together instead of just counter, and now it's asking for the hours. So let's say we're gonna really go hardcore that day and we're gonna play for nine hours, all right? And there you go. So as you can see, that's how you would read multiple characters, uh, multiple words at a time. Uh, just to show you as a proof of concept, I suppose, let's put the delimiter to be a comma. If I run this now and I say uh, four comma night, you will see that uh, I just it just killed me. I don't know the first okay so i don't know why the first time it was it just lagged out but it was working as expected okay so we can put four comma night like that as you can see it stops reading at the comma because that's our delimiter in fact if i did fortnite or valorant comma or league of legends You can see that it stops reading after comma and ignores games that are not real. So there you go. Uh, as you can see, that comma is actually where it stops reading. And in this case, it kept going because it took the or as a, 
as the hours that you would play the game. So yes. So anyways, that's what your that's what this does. But like I said, if you don't have this parameter in here, or if you leave it as a default, which is backslash n, then it'll just read until the uh, ender. So I could write a uh, 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 what's what's a game that's a big game? Uh, Super Mario World. Oh, by the way, you know you do this. Ah, it's, it's lagging again. Otherwise, doing that, it's glitching out. Super Mario World. Did I? I don't know why it's doing that. Is this called fifth program? I compiling the right. Yeah. Okay, so now it's working. I don't know. It's it's kind of glitchy. Um, but anyways, if you go in there and we put eight, then it works just fine. Uh, however. What I'm gonna say is, if you uh, if your delimiter maybe is a comma again, you could actually do both things at once here. You could say I'm gonna play uh, Super Mario World, comma five, and it'll actually go and take the Super Mario World, and then it'll take the five for the hours, and you don't have to do it again. That's because a comma. It stops reading but for anyways that's just because i wanted to show you that for now just stick to the old good old get line and you know that works as fan and yes i guess i'm a meanie against sleep i don't know why it's just the internet meme i've never played it yet so yeah okay uh questions questions about uh interactive input and so on counter strike yes we're not, we're not, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't give Gabe new money. How do you stop going to the problem with input everything again? Oh, that's a good question. So like when the thing was frozen or glitched out, what I went ahead and did is I use the control key in my keyboard and then the C. If you do control C, it terminates the ongoing program and brings you back to the terminal. Useful for when weird things like that happen where it like lags out or glitches out. So uh, if I run that program again and be, and, uh, and I keep compiling before running. I don't have to do that. It's just a habit uh, because it's, if you don't compile and you update code, you're, you're like, why is it not changing? You know. So I just kind of burned that in my brain that before running a program, I just build it every time. So anyway, but yeah, here it's expecting input. So I, I type in control and then Z and it closes it. And you can even see that little C there uh, and the hat symbol means control. So it's literally doing that. So very, very useful to uh, stop a program. And now that you learn interactive input, it's possible that your program could hang forever, or if you're stuck in a loop or something when we talk about loops. So control C is a very useful shortcut to terminate your programs uh, if, if you so deem that to be the necessity at the time. So, other questions? Uh, we didn't get to if statements. That's okay. So that assignment is definitely not due uh, until like Wednesday of next week or something. So the third assignment. We will, however, uh, uh, have the assignment to deadline uh, stick to be due when it's due on campus right now. So don't worry. Um, <clears throat> we should cover all of if statements. And we st we're still within this within the schedule um, because, uh, I mean, we covered three chapters, essentially. And actually four chapters because we, we just did interactive input, which was chapter four. So, uh, yeah. We're good. Four chapters, four days. Not bad. So anything else before we end the stream? Uh, check Discord, and I'll also make a Canvas announcement once I check the poll on what the times are and I decide. I'll try to make that decision tomorrow. Uh, that way you guys know ahead of time. Uh, whether the time will be changed, remains. I hope it gets changed. It's definitely way too late to do 7. Like, like it's 9 p.m. now. I'm like, uh, so, uh, but I'll see if you guys really like the seven, then, then I'll stick to it. So, uh, like I said, it was, I think what I had seen before was 9, 10 a.m. starting time was the most popular. And then like 5 p.m. in the evenings. And like I said, it was like this, but there was only, I think 13 people that voted then. And there's like 30 people in the class. So that could be completely different than what I see now. So I'll check that out and, and I'll talk on Discord about that. Either way, the videos are always uploaded. Uh, they, they've been being uploaded around 1 a.m. because that's how long it takes for the upload and processing to do. So that's what time you can expect this video to show up. So yes, uh, make sure you get your homework done. 
make sure you well it's too late now i hope you did the quiz but uh make sure you're all on discord that's very important and uh that's it anything anybody i hope you guys uh, are following along and learning i'm trying to be as thorough as possible and assume zero knowledge that way i don't say like oh yeah this is a variable just move on you know i'm assuming if anything i'm assuming a little bit of algebra knowledge so yeah but cool all right then i'm available on discord over the weekend so if anybody has questions you can message me the ta but post it on public chat you know that way we can all uh you can all contribute especially when you guys have all these weird issues with like the bm stuff uh it, it, you know it's good to post it publicly so we can all see what's happening but all right then cool yes absorb absorb knowledge because knowledge is power so all right then cool guys well then in that case i will see you guys um i'll see you guys on monday and have a good weekend stay safe bye